Hey everyone, this is Baphometrics, and in this video I'm doing a follow-up to my previous video that I put out just yesterday. Uh, it's number 13 in my series, talking about uh, the counter modulator and how to convert organic drum loops to MIDI that you can then make variants of. Um, and just to catch you up, if you haven't watched number 13 yet, uh, the basic idea behind that video was to demonstrate a common use case of taking a organic drum loop like this one and converting it to MIDI drums that sound exactly like the organic drum loop, including all of the nuanced variation and articulation of the hits on the different drum sounds in the loop. So just to recap very briefly, uh, this is the original drum loop and what it sounds like. And as you can hear, it has a lot of variation to the kick, the snare, and the hi-hat sounds. There's a lot of different articulations. The hats are in different degrees of closed and kind of semi-open. Um, the kick has a lot of different uh, transient type impacts to it, and even the snare hits have some transient impact to them. And uh, the idea of the last video was to convert this into MIDI drums and make them sound exactly the same. So here's what the MIDI drums sound like. I'm gonna start with the organic drum loop and then flip over to the MIDI drums and then flip back and forth a little bit so you can hear they're basically the same thing. Okay, so that was the point of the last video. And uh, if these two didn't sound exactly the same, it's because in the interest of speed, I didn't want to go reset all of the note counters, uh, which was one of the main techniques for achieving this kind of use case. Uh, I didn't want to reset them all to zero. I'm just trying to quickly move on to the new stuff I want to cover in this video. So I had an interesting comment uh, a good comment, very helpful comment from a person on, on the video that I put out yesterday. And their basic point was, why did you explain such a convoluted technique when there's a thing called round robin in the sampler that will play one sample after another in the order you put them in? And I totally get why this person was you know, questioned this and, you know, why do you go to this trouble of like manually slicing up the multi-sample and then adjusting things and then using a note counter when you could just have dragged in a bunch of notes in a way that uh, Bitwig calls round robin and achieve the same effect, all right? And, and this is a really interesting nuance and I've wanted to talk about round robin anyway because it's unique to Bitwig and Ableton, I, I'm pretty sure it doesn't have anything like it. Although, to be honest, I haven't gone looking for this in Ableton, but I, I kind of think if Ableton had round robin, I would have known about it by now <laughs> after using Ableton for so long. So don't quote me on that, but I think this is unique to Bitwig. Um, and then I also wanted to introduce a new technique uh, using the randomize uh, modulator, the random modulator to achieve a similar thing in a different way. So I'm just going to launch into those two things right now. Uh, the basic idea, I want to show you round robin first and how it works, and then I'm going to address uh, that person's great comment on my video and explain why round robin wasn't an appropriate thing to use for this specific use case. So first let's talk about what round robin is. I'm going to make a new um, a new MIDI, a new track and put sampler in it. Bop down here and find sampler. Okay. So we have sampler. Uh, it's just by itself. We're going to click to create a new multi sample and get the multi sample editor up here. And now I'm going to go over to my browser and find some drum samples. 
my audience and drum sample? Sure. So here's here's just a random set of kicks. Uh, I was messing around earlier, so I already have some selected. So I've got, I don't know, 10, 12 kicks here. Now, here's what normally happens. I'm going to show you a couple new things about the sampler and especially multi-samples that I haven't shown you before. Um, in previous videos, like number eight and number 13, you've seen me setting up multi-samples, especially number eight, where I explain how to make 128s in Bitwig. But the basic idea is if you drag a set of samples into uh, the basic grid-based view of sampler, and you keep your cursor kind of close to the keyboard keys here, what you'll find is that it will place each sample on its own note, and it's going to root each sample to that particular note. So in this case, we're starting from C1 through uh, uh, B flat. I'm sorry, C1 through B flat one, right? And if I if I have a small enough set of samples, if I move my cursor up, it's going to start trying to spread out those samples to cover more keys, like right about here. There we go. So now it's trying to use basically two keys per sample, and it's going to root them on, on whichever key has that green highlight color. If I move it up some more, it's going to try and spread them farther and farther apart. And depending on how many samples I'm holding, if I go up almost to the top, like right here, it's trying to spread each sample across an entire half octave. Um, and you can see where the green, light green, keys are noted on the keyboard, that's where the root key of each one of these samples is going to be. And then it'll do a little bit of key tracking up and downward, like three or four or five semitones on either side of that, right? Now, if I keep moving up, it's now stacking all those samples on top of each other. I still have all 10 or however many of these samples. They're all going to drop down. They're all going to be rooted on wherever this green highlight is. Like now they're rooted on C2. Um, but they're literally stacked on top of each other, and they're all there. So that's one behavior to understand is, is there's some cases where you might want to do this. Um, there's also a thing that can happen if I drag all the way down into this boundary between the keyboard and the bottom of the grid. See how they all collapsed onto one note like this, but it's still all 10 of those samples stacked on top of each other. All right, so you may ask, why would you want to do this? And one of the reasons is, well, sometimes you might want to have two or three different samples literally play together in a layered way when you hit a certain note. Like, I may be making a multi-sample that is, uh, I don't know, some kind of you know, mid-bass sounding multi-sample for electronic music. And so I might want to have a sample that is literally a sub kind of sample and another sample that's a top bass, kind of mid-bass layer, and another sample that might be a little bit of white noise at a very low volume, and another sample that is some other kind of mid-bass maybe that I want to phase a little bit with the first mid-bass. And anyway, I might want to have four different samples stacked up on one note or stacked up together, spread across the entire keyboard so that I can play it uh, in a melodic way, right? Not just one note, but several notes, and it'll change pitch and key track them. You know, I might want to have them layered so they all play at the same time with one key. So it's a layered sound. So that's why you might want to do some of this stuff, right? This would assign it to only one key. This would assign it across the entire keyboard polyphonically. And then something in the middle would you know, now I'm back to separate. These are all separate, and this is a more traditional way to do multi-sample setup. So anyway, that's the basic behavior of this grid. Now, watch what happens if instead, I'm going to come back here and let go again. This time as I drag, I want you to look down at the uh, bottom area, and I'm going to press and hold the Alt key while I'm dragging. And watch what it says down in the bottom status area. I start dragging, and I hold down Alt. And see how it says round robin at the bottom? And by default, it's trying to put all those samples on one key. Okay, that's this is one way to set up round robin. Um, by holding all while you drag over the samples. And if I let go, I've got all 10 of these samples. They're rooted on C1. 
And by default, if you look over here in the inspector, you'll see this thing called zone logic, and it says round robin. Um, now, by as, as a different way of doing it, let me show you what happens if I, I'm going to grab a different set of kicks, and I'm going to drag them over and pull down until I'm in that boundary between uh, the keyboard and the grid, and I'm going to drop these on C2. And if you look over here at the zone logic now, now that I have this one C2 zone, right? Each key is a zone in the key zone area, which this is always key zone, uh, this big grid. When I have the zone for C2 selected, the zone logic says always play. So always play means if I hit C2, all 10 of those samples are going to play together at the same time as a layer stacked right on top of each other, just a big wall of noise, right? So it'd be like 10 kicks hitting at once in this case. But if I select this zone, it says round robin. And so what that means is every time I hit C1, it's going to roll through these uh, kicks in order. Now let me flip over to a different view so you can see the, the kicks a little bit better. When you're in this mode with the, the sort of stair step, this view is showing you that these kicks from here to here are the kicks that are on the C1 key at the top. And these kicks from here to here are on the C2 key at the top. So because this zone for C1, and it's a little harder to select them here. Uh, I just have to sort of eyeball it visually. If I select all these, we can see that any one of these kicks, as I select each one, it keeps saying round robin over here. So it's telling me all of these kicks in the zone that they're currently sitting on, they're set up to play round robin with each other. But as I start selecting the kicks down here that correspond to this zone for C2, you're going to see over here it switches to say always, always play for each one. Okay, so this is an important nuance because you can get confused by this if you if you don't wrap your head around it. Now by default, Bitwig keeps you safe and just always layers things up and says always play. And you have to do a special modifier like holding down Alt while you're dragging those things in to set them up in this round robin kind of way. Um, or I could convert all of these to round robin by uh, picking all of them and then just setting this to round robin and it's going to affect all of them. And now this C2 zone, every single kick in it is set up to play in a round robin order, which means, you know, start with the first note. And then the next time I hit C2, it'll play this one. And the next time I hit C2, it'll play this one. And the next time I play C2, it'll hit this one. And it's just walk through them in order, round robin, and just keep cycling through one at a time in order. Okay, so this is very handy. And I'll, I'll show you one potential use case for this in a second. Uh, but here's another interesting thing. I'm going to set these ones back to always play. And then I'm going to do a thing like select the first uh, five or six of them, six of them, and I'm going to set these to round robin, but I'm going to leave these other three set to always play. Now think about what that's going to do. What this means is every time I play a C2 key, all three of these samples will play with every press of the C2 key, but the other samples in this stack, in this zone, these other ones are going to play on the first press of C2, that one plus these three will play. Then on the next press of C2, this one plus these bottom three will play. Then in the next C2 note that hits, this one plus the bottom three will play and so on. So you can do some very interesting and flexible things by playing with round robin. The main thing to remember is round robin is never random. It's always in order. Uh, I think from top to bottom in this list, although I could be wrong about that. Um, maybe it's first come, first serve. There's a couple different ways to order this list, but honestly, I don't know 
how that works. I don't know if rearranging this by velocity or by uh, its root key might change the round robin order. I honestly don't know enough about that, so I'm not going to try and say anything about that. You can experiment, figure that out. But that's this is the basic idea behind round robin. So let's see this kind of in action. Um, I think the best way to show you this in action and show you a typical use case for it would be to take this MIDI drums and we'll duplicate it. And we'll make this a different color so it stands out. Um, now in this drum rack, let's do this with, yeah, we'll do this with the kicks, that's fine. Um, I have a multi-sample already set up and if I, if I play this, it's going to effectively do a round robin of these 10 kick multi-samples that are in here, but it's doing the round robin because of the note counter modulator that I set up. And again, to understand how the note counter works, please look at the previous video, number 13, and you'll understand how this is working. But you're going to see a round robin behavior here. As every kick comes in on C1, each time a kick comes in, it's going to play a different sample in that multi-sample. And just so you can hear what the, the kicks themselves sound like, if I double click to open it up and I switch back to this view and I hold down control and scroll wheel in to zoom a little bit to make it easier to play those keys, you can hear how each one of these kicks from the original loop sounds slightly different. Uh, what am I missing here? All right, all right, all right. Let's make sure this is playing first. Okay, so you should be making sounds. Um, yeah, don't know what went on there. Let's go back up here again. So you should be able to watch this cycle through these as I play the loop. And it started not on zero because of the funky way note counter works right now. Let me reset it to zero so that it will actually start on zero. So this is zero on this side, and this is nine over on this side. And each new note advances the counter, and it just rolls through in a round robin fashion. Okay. So getting back to the, the comment that person made, oh, and you can also see this behavior if I just press the play button on the kick itself. So let's reset it to zero, and the first button should play the first zero position slot on this side. Next one will do the second kick, third, fourth. And you can just see it walking through in a round robin way. But here's the thing, and this is what the, the person who gave the comment, I think maybe miss didn't quite fully understand the use case I was explaining. Um, this is a multi-sample where each of the samples is set up on a different zone. Each one of the keys is a zone, so we have 10 different zones here, and round robin doesn't work over something like this. For round robin behavior to work, we have to, um, for round robin behavior to work in the zone logic, all of these samples would have to be stacked into one single zone together. So they would all have to be stacked on this C0 key, for example. And then round robin would just play through all of them sequentially, like I demonstrated earlier. And that would help us achieve this same exact use case where each of these uh, drum things is like here's my hats and you're going to you're going to see the hats flip through let's close this so you don't get confused just watch down here you're going to see the hats roll through in a round robin order when i play the loop so the hats are just rolling through and every hat is a slightly different sounding hat um so to set up this particular kind of drum kit to have the same exact behavior, 
I would need to have access to all of these sample slices. And again, let's look at what they actually look like. You know, this is just one loop called kickboxer bounce for wave that I made this from. And as I select each slice, scroll in a little bit, you'll see that it's just, you know, playing a different region from the original loop that had uh, a hi-hat hit on it. Okay, that's all this is doing. And you can hear they all sound slightly different. Oh, come on, why aren't you making noise for me? Well, I'll just walk through it this way. See how they're all very different sounding hats? And uh, some of them are even kind of layered with a very light snare hit. Because that was what was going on in the original loop. It's the original drum loop is, is a kind of a boogaloo loop where there's lots of ghost hits on the snares. So the point is, uh, this whole thing was created starting from a single drum loop that looked like this. And the way that we got to those multi-samples was by right-clicking and doing slice to multi-sample. Uh, and slicing at the onsets. It's a two-bar loop with a 16th note bass drum pattern. So there's basically 32 of these blue colored onsets here. So when I slice it, it's going to slice at each of the onsets and create 32 slices. And when I, you know, double click and look at the MIDI, it's just playing one successive MIDI note for each slice from start to finish. And the actual multi-sample is right here. And if we open it up and look at it, it looks like this. Okay, so this was this was what slice to drum sample created. And in the previous video, number 13, I showed how to go from here to that layered MIDI drum kit that was rolling through each of the kicks and hats and snares one at a time in a round robin order. So the person who made this comment was like, why go to all that trouble of you know cutting out all the, the sounds that aren't kicks and then moving the kicks right next to each other and then using that no counter thing. Why go to all that trouble when you could have just set this up as round robin? And my answer, very simply, is you can't easily get to a round robin setup when you're starting with slice to multi-sample. Every one of these samples in this slice is the same single real sample. They're just the original drum loop, and all these multi-sample things are, are pointers to different sections of that single sample. So if I go over here and look in my project library, and we look at the files that are in this project, you see the multi-samples I built originally, but they're, they're a special thing. You can't get inside of them. There's literally no way to get inside the multi-sample itself, and if you're looking at a multi-sample, it's it's represented by just one big loop in the first place, right? In this case, because it was sliced to multi-sample. So there's no simple, easy way to get all of these 32 samples out and into my browser or into a, a file folder somewhere so that they're, they're listed as individual samples that I could then select and drag in and hold Alt and put them on a single key and set them up as round robin to play with round robin. There's just no way to get from a here to a round robin situation, right? So that's why I use the technique I used shown in the previous video, where you basically just have to go play some games and edit this multi-sample and turn it into three different multi-samples that separate out the you know, one sample collects all the hat hits together, one sample multi-sample collects all the kick hits together, and the, the third multi-sample collects all the snares, and you're starting from this each time. Um, you can't get these out anyway. If I tear off the browser here, you can click this window, by the way, to make it a smaller uh, floating window, so you can get back to your interface and do things. You can do something like grab this slice and click and drag and drop it into, you know, an empty area on the thing here. But what you end up with is the whole sample, right? Because that's what this slice is based on. It's the entire sample 
it's just got start and end markers in one spot. But when you drag from here out into the the system, you don't get you don't get the play start and end markers. It's just a clip, right? And if I were to try and drag directly from here into a different sampler, I don't even think that'll work, but let's try it. <laughs> let's put sampler up here. Okay, so I'm putting sampler on a new track down here. Let's get into this so it's an empty sampler. Uh, let's just see if I can drag in this sample from here into the sampler and have it have the start and end play markers set up the same way in the new sampler instance on this track. I kind of don't think it'll let me do that, but maybe, let's see. So I hover over the track title, come down here. Yeah, see, it's not even gonna let me drop the sample in here. So there's literally no simple and easy way to use slice to multi-sample, then look at the multi-sample like this, and then somehow get these individual slices out. Literally, the only way to do this would be to, um, let's put this back together. Let's delete this track, let's delete this track, and we'll start from here where, where the original slice to multi-sample ended up. For me to pull out each one of these slices, I literally have to resample one note at a time starting at C1 here. I have to resample just this short C1 hit and then resample just this next hit and then the next one and then the next one and then the next one. And, you know, resampling is never any fun. It's fairly easy to do, but you got to set up new tracks. You got to set up the routing. You got to click, to, you know, record, arm to record. And then when you actually do the recording, chances are really good. You're going to get a little bit of like unnecessary start and end to the clip. So you're going to have to go into the clip and edit it and set the start and end point precisely for the clip and then consolidate the clip to get rid of the actual stuff that's still hidden outside it in the event that's on. I mean, it just gets, it's a nightmare. So there's no, no, there's just simply no fast way to, in this work case, this use case, to start with a loop, slice it to a multi-sample, and then somehow turn this into individual samples in a folder or in your browser that you can then drag together into a different multi-sample editor and create them round robin style can't be done. Okay, so that's uh, kind of a long-winded answer in case anyone else wonders the same question that that, that person had. Um, now, round robin. Round robin is great. It's wonderful if you're starting from, uh, if you're starting from one-shot samples that are over in your browser. And let's let's demonstrate that. Let's just start a new track here with uh, an empty drum machine on it. Okay. So if I'm going to build up uh, a drum pattern in an interesting way in Bitwig, this is a really nice thing you can do that, I, again, I don't think Ableton can do. Let's find... Uh, work in F. Let's see if these kicks are similar sounding enough. Let me do this. Let's type F. All right. So let's let's audition these kicks real quick and see what they sound like. Oh, damn. Sorry about that. Okay, that's a big fat 808. Let's turn that down a lot. Okay, here's two kicks that are similar, but slightly different. Right, one's a little, got a little more body and a little more tail. Right, so let's say, uh, let's see if there's one more that's kind of close, but they sound similar in ways. Okay, that one sounds good too. So we're gonna take this kick, this kick, and this kick, and we're gonna select them all. And let's see if this will work. <laughs> I haven't tried doing it directly onto a drum pad. Yeah, no, it's going to try and spread them out onto three different drum pads. So let's do this a different way. I'm going to let go. Uh, in the drum pad, we're going to click and put sampler down. OK, 
Okay, and we're gonna create multi-sample, and now I'm gonna take these three kicks, start dragging them, and then I'm going to put them on C1 because that's what the drum pad is set at. And I'm gonna hold down Alt to crunch them down into a round robin format, and I'm gonna drop them right on C1. So now I have three kicks that sound kind of similar to each other. And as I walk through each one, you're gonna see they're all set up with this round robin zone logic. So now what's gonna happen by default is every time I click uh, C1, Super loud, let's turn it back down. Fly this out just so I can get to the volume control for the drum machine. All right, that's about right. So you're not gonna see much behavior here, although if I flip here, you'll probably see it. The first time I play, you, you should see it rolling through these three different selectors, uh, I think. Let's see what happens. <laughs> And you can also, it's tiny, so you can see a green flash here too. Um, but because these are on a single key and it's very tiny, you can't really see it well. And I, I can't zoom this view like I could the other view. So anyway. So you could have, you could drag in like three very similar sounding kicks, but with a little variation between them. I could drag in like 20 different hi-hats. Let's do that. Let's just do it. Let's do this right. Let's find some hi-hats. Let's go to Jack U. Let's find some hats. Okay, so I got a ton of different hi-hats here and they're all gonna be really different sounding. So normally I'd be a little choosy in my selection, but let's grab, uh, actually let's go up higher and start here. Let's grab like this many of them. And then we'll create a sampler here. And we're gonna find top of the hats and let's create a multi-sample. Let's grab the first hat, drag it up in here. I've got that many hats, hold down Alt to squish them together. And we're gonna put them on F1 because that's where that pad is. Okay, so again, if I flip over to this view so we can see all the individual samples and what's actually being played, Every time I click this button, right? So you can get some interesting variation to your hi-hat hits and your kick hits and your snare hits and whatever in a drum machine by using this round robin technique, right? And, and so this is an easy, simple way to set up something similar to what my last video was about, but it only works if you're starting from one-shot samples that are over in your, your browser, in your sample library. It's not gonna work if you're starting with slice to multi-sample, okay? So I beat that one to death. Let's talk about the other really interesting thing that uh, I wanted to show y'all. So let's get rid of this one. Let's go back to our original uh, Boogaloo Drums MIDI. So <clears throat> I set this up so it would play the kick and hat and snare articulations in exactly the same order as appeared in the original drum loop. That's the reason for using counter. And you could choose to do it a different way. And this will work regardless of uh, how you get your multi-samples uh, into a drum machine. I'm going to show you a, a different and very typical use case for drum machines to kind of drive this home. So a lot of us who use 128s will uh, pre-create multi-samples. And so I have multi-samples of claps, crashes, 
some gunshot sounds, some closed and open hi-hats, kicks, percussion, shaker, snare, and so on. And the way we'll set up a drum kit, those of us who like to use 128s as well, you know, literally just drag one of these 97s over to a drum pad. It's filled with 97 different kick samples. And um, depending on what you add to this, you can make it easy to select and move among these kick samples. I wouldn't really do it this way. In real world, I would do something I showed in the last video and also in video number eight in my series about making 128s. The way I would really do this in my workflow is I would use a preset of my own. I just had to make this one time and now it's always there. I have what I call a drum pad 97, that if I drag it onto a drum pad, it's it's just a sampler with a 97 lo note loaded into it, but it has a few extra goodies on it. And one of the extra goodies it has is um, a key tracking modulator and two note pitch shifters that basically make it so that I can control which one of these samples in the 97 is used for this kick note uh, simply by moving the selector knob. If I put it right in the middle, it's going to play whatever sample is sitting right on C4. If I move it all the way to the left, it's going to play the sample down here on C0. And if I move it all the way to the right, it's going to play the sample that's way up here on uh, C8. And so I can audition uh, hits while, and let me turn on push. I should have had it on beforehand. You'll see a potentially a crash message come up here. All right, now it's working. So let me just demo this for you real quick. Where's my C1? There we go. So turn that baby down. About there. Okay, so I'm just going to turn the select knob on my push for this particular drum machine instance. Swing it all the way over here to the left. You'll see this button moving, this knob moving as I, I move the selector on my push and play C1 on my push. And see how as I move the selector knob, it's um, picking different samples out of this 97. So this is a more typical use case. Uh, I describe how to build this in video number eight of my series. I also have a section in my Bitwig handbook. Uh, and there's a link to this handbook in all of my videos in this Bitwig versus Ableton series. And somewhere here in the section on drum rack stuff, I explain how to build this thing called a drum pad 97. Okay, so some of you have seen this already, some of you haven't, that's why I'm pointing it out again. So at any rate, the thing I would do is um, drag copies of this drum pad onto different pads. So I'm gonna do kick, hat, snare, just because that's a pattern I like to play with my fingers when I'm finger drumming on my, on my push. Um, so over here in the hats, uh, if I open this up, I can simply come to my selection of multi samples and find like my closed hats and just drag one of these multi samples and replace the kicks that are there. Boom. Now I have 97 hats that I can scroll through. Uh, so if I play this key and roll through the uh, selector, where are you? My push is being recalcitrant at the moment. Come here. All right. I've got myself into a strange state here. Moss has uh, changed the behavior of the push in the latest 2.4 update. I'm not, my, my muscle memory isn't set up correctly yet. Where are you? Scale, no, come on, it's just right here. And show me my mic, show me my device, show me my clip. Where is it? <laughs> All right, I'm stuck. I may have run into a bug with, with push for Bitwig, but um, I'll just do it this way. So hi-hat, let's move the selector a little bit. Okay, so different hi-hats, so same basic thing. And so a lot of us use 128s or in Bitwig, they're really 97s. 
Uh, and I explain that in other videos, why that is, and I'll also in my handbook. Um, this is what we would do. And so you might decide, well, what if I don't want to manually choose just one sample to play? What if I want to automatically and randomly pick among any of these samples at any given range, right? Uh, maybe I want to, maybe I like the first 10 samples and I just want to randomly flip around as I'm playing each note for a hi-hat. I want it to pick a different one of these 10 samples every time. Or maybe I want it to pick something out of this entire range of 97 samples. So here's a, a simple little trick you can do with uh, the random modulator. So in this hi-hat, section, we're going to go grab random. And a couple things about random. By default, it always comes in a polyphonic mode, and that's not what you want. Uh, let's go over here. If I click this, see how it's got this little dot? Damn, I wish I hadn't messed up my push. Let's just turn it off and turn it on again, see if I can reinitialize it. Okay, that's looking better. So layout, all right. So as you can see right now, when I play the hi-hat, it's playing this one sample right here that's flashing green. Um, let's set the selector all the way to the bottom. So we're playing this very first hi-hat. Now, let's say I want it to pick randomly any hi-hat within the first 10 samples in this slice. The way I would do that, oh, oh, I was gonna show you what poly does. So <laughs> the way this polyphonic modulator works, if the random is in poly mode right here, if I play three things at once, well, we're not seeing it here. If I were able to polyphonically play on a hi-hat, if I were in a melodic, sample of some sort that was spanning multiple keys, you'd see several dots on here. So the first clue that you're in the wrong mode is when you don't see a constantly traveling line like this. And for whatever reason, the random modulator always comes in by default in polyphonic mode and in a bipolar mode. Um, turn poly off so you get the line. And then you'll start seeing some random behavior happening with the line. Uh, now, the randomness of the line depends on factors like your speed, what you're syncing it to, whether or not it's free running or synced to the host clock. Uh, but what we want for this use case is note, which means every incoming note will simply trigger a different random value. So if I press the hi-hat now, you're gonna see with each click, you're gonna see that random line jump to a different value. See, it's just responsive to the incoming MIDI notes and it'll just jump to a random value every time. Um, so to make it choose among the first 10 samples in my, in my 97 here, the trick is to assign a modulator from that randomizer to the final device in the note, uh, the note container for the sampler, the final device that's actually controlling which specific, um, oh, not again, device. Oh. Why are you not showing me my knobs anymore? I'm stumped. Okay, I think I found a bug with Moss's code. I'll have to see if I can figure that out and report that later. Uh, so, it's this value right here that, let's see if I can fit everything on the screen at one time so you can see it. Let's turn off the inspector. All right. As I move the selector knob over here, watch what happens to this value over in semitones at the very end starts from negative 48 to positive 48, and there's also a value in the middle at zero. And by the way, 
just briefly, that's why you can only do a 97 in Bitwig, because you can only select a total range of 48 plus 48 is 96, and then zero in the middle makes 97. So there's 97 possible values that you can select with this particular selector. And I'm not gonna go into why I'm using MIDI notes and this zone instead of the new select zone. You can go watch video number eight to understand why this type of 128 that we call a rhythmic 128 is using this technique and not using the new select knob. This is used for a different type of 128 we call a melodic 128. Okay, so anyway, uh, the idea is I wanna start over here and I wanna take this value and modulate it up by 10 with the random knob. So you do that by clicking the modulator assignment and left click on this and start dragging up. And I wanna set it to a value of plus 10. Now, it's, sometimes it's hard to set exact values with your mouse. So what I like to do is just pick any positive value and then come back here to the uh, random modulator. We're gonna have to close this multi-sample window down. Uh, pick the random modulate. Oh, I just need to open up my inspector. That's what's wrong. I'm back here one more time. And so here's the assignment. I'm just going to uh, control click on this and set it to exactly 10. That's the easy way to set precise values for your modulators instead of having to fiddle with your mouse. Um, so now this random modulator is going to go as high as plus 10 above the starting point here. And so that means it's just going to jump around between these first 10 samples in the 97 as I play incoming notes. So let's turn off the modulator assignment and watch what happens. Let me go ahead and blow this up uh, with a, let's do this way, come on, this way. We're going to get the fly out window so we can see things without obscuring too much. Start here. Okay, so I should only be playing about the first of these samples to about here. Now, it's the specific um, settings we have on the randomizer that's controlling how often it'll actually jump to a different value versus maybe playing the same note twice in a row. Uh, this gets a little confusing to talk about, but basically, why am I in this weird edit mode? Why am I in that weird edit mode? Huh, interesting. Let's close this window. That's, no, weird. Like I have a key stuck on. Okay, that's better. That's what I expect to see. So uh, let's talk about how this behavior works. If, uh, oh, I should close that so we don't get confused. We want to be on this one. So if we let this free run and we're set on Hertz, this kind of controls the speed. Again, just look at the second one down here. That's the one I'm controlling right now. As I speed it up, the little increments get a lot smaller. So I slow it down, the increments get farther and wider apart, right? So that's Hertz. Uh, I could also set it up to be like every bar synced to the, the host clock or every half note or every quarter note, eighth note, 16th note, so on. Um, we can set it up, well, you would have to have sync on in order to have, well, okay. All these modulators, this will actually truly uh, modulate according to a beat division of your current tempo, but it won't start in sync with your transport unless you have it set here to sync. And then it kind of like lines up the actual beats and bars of your, your arrangement grid, your timeline, to the beat and bar values here. If you don't have this set to sync when you pick one of these beat division values, it won't really be synced, okay? So that's a, a little gotcha you have to think about. If you, want, if you want it to truly run free and wild, 
and you pick free running mode here, then I suggest you always pick Hertz or kilohertz for the speed and set it up that way. Um, now what these knobs do, this is how much the modulation is, how big it is. Like as I pull it all the way to the left, it's just a flat line again here in the second modulator. As I move it up, those lines start getting a little further apart. And so this is just how much it will modulate the jumps. Uh, this thing here smooths out the shape between a squarish kind of integer jumping state. Uh, I forget what the technical word for that is. My bad. Discrete. These are discrete jumps. As I move this slider up, it becomes less discrete and more wave-like, more smoothed. And now it starts looking more like a, a kind of a wild, crazy sine wave. Okay, so that's what this one does. And then this one here basically controls uh, how far apart the jumps are, but kind of, sort of, not in an obvious way. Right around the middle is where the biggest jumps are likely to occur. And if I flip it all the way to the left, uh, what happens is, and if I, let's see. Are you going to make a liar out of me? Yeah, you can see it now. See how they've stabilized into this alternating pattern that is uh, exactly the same jump up or down? That's what pulling it all the way to the left does, is it says kind of like normalize them, uh, normalize the skew, bring the skew all the way to an even skew value. And it's gonna sort of hold and freeze at whatever the last biggest jump distance was. Like, let me wait for a big jump and then I'm gonna slam this down to the left there. Nope, I waited too long there. Okay, so when I, when I pull it over here, it's basically like a sample and hold. And it's gonna remember whatever the, the last value you had, it just starts alternating positive and minus between those values. Or if I set it to unipolar, uh, let's crank it up here. And now it's just moving in positive values above the middle line. I'm gonna wait for a big jump and slam it down again. Okay, so I froze it at that value. Let's wait for another jump. There, now I froze it at a bigger value and so on. So this is what this does, is it kind of like moves it from a random movement that starts slewing them and skewing them together and gather. Um, or you could think of it as the spread, like, yeah, you could think of it as spread. So this pulls it more towards an even spread and locks it in place. Uh, this will, you know, halfway over, will give it a little bit of movement. It's kind of smoothing it out but it's still kind of holding it in a range between wherever it was at its, you know, value before you started yanking it down. Now, over on this side, it does a little more of a um, pulling the randomness together so that, you know, as I get all the way over here to the right, it's a flat line again or very close to a flat line. Like those random jumps just aren't moving that much. And as I move back, Further this way, the random jumps will get a little farther apart. So this is kind of another way to control how close they are together, but letting it remain uh, kind of random. But the main thing to remember is right in the middle is, is the biggest jumps possible. And by default, it's set to like 24% feedback, which is fine. Uh, that gives it a little more of a chance for the two jumps to be fairly close together kind of. Um, so this is the main one you want to play with in most cases to get the kind of randomized behavior you want. And I just do it by looking at the line. I, wait, I either leave it at its default value or I put it at center or I just kind of move in this direction until I get the kind of jumps I feel I want. So we want to give this the biggest jumps possible. And uh, if I want it to jump now across a wider range of these keys, all I have to do is change the modulation value from 10 to something like 50. So I'll control click, 50. All right, and now it's gonna jump pretty much halfway across, but it won't go into this area. So let's play a few keys. Okay, so that's the basic idea behind using random 
on a multi-sample full of similar enough sounding samples to get some variation, some human variation in your pattern. And now finally, uh, the last thing to show you is picking up again from my last video where I talked about this one specific use case of playing all these multi-samples in order. You could alternatively say, well, maybe I want the kicks and the snares to play in the original order from the original drum loop, but let's make the hats. Instead of playing in order by using the note counter device, let's select the note counter device and press uh, my shortcut key to deactivate it. So now it gets grayed out. And it's this checkbox up here if you want to do it manually, or it's the same shortcut key you would use to deactivate uh, a clip or to deactivate an entire track, right? Deactivate is the same everywhere. So we've deactivated this note counter and we're gonna add a random. And we're gonna count up how many samples are in this multi-sample. So I'm gonna double click to open the editor. I'm going to select the first and last sample. So I have 14 total samples in this particular multi-sample. So I'm gonna to wanna to set this randomizer to uh, modulate by 14. So first thing I wanna do is turn off poly. So I get my line and we're gonna see it start doing its almost full range of modulation. I'm gonna put it right in the center. Uh, and again, control click, set it to zero. If you wanna make sure it's dead center, we want it to trigger on note. We want it to have the maximum modulation possible. Uh, this rate doesn't matter when it's note-based, it's always gonna trigger for each new incoming MIDI note, like I showed you earlier. So now we just need to assign this modulator to the last note pitch shifter, and we wanna increment it as far as 14. So I'll just drag this up, get it close to 14, and then I'll come over here and control click and set this to exactly 14 in the inspector. And now we're set up. So now if I play this drum loop, uh, what's gonna happen are the kick and the snare will keep cycling round robin in the same order as the original uh, drum loop, but the hi-hats will now be randomized and just jumping around here randomly. So let's hear that. And see how the hi-hats are now random. And I don't personally like that sound because it's not like the original clip. Let, let's kind of A, B it against the original that's playing the hi-hats in round robin order. Let me play this one more time for you. It sounds a little stilted. It sounds a little computery. It sounds not human, right? So now if I deactivate the random, sorry, deactivate the random and reactivate the counter, Let's reset it to zero and let's restart the clip. Okay, that sounds much more natural. So there's definitely a use case for this note counter and it's when you're trying to duplicate an original uh, multi-sample loop. You can't use round robin in this use case, it's just too difficult. It's a lot easier to do it the way I showed you in the last video. But if you're just building up a drum kit from scratch, or if you're working with your own 97s from scratch and you have you know, you know, feel like the sounds in your 97 are good enough and close enough in tone and characteristic and timbre that you could just randomly pick any of them to create some randomization, great, you can do that. Uh, so hopefully you found this video interesting. Thanks for hanging with me. And as always, if you uh, appreciate the time I, I put into these, uh, please do me a solid. Come to my Bitwig handbook or look in the comments for the video. You'll find links to my SoundCloud and Spotify. And please go give me a follow. That, that would really be a nice way to show appreciation. All right. Thanks. See you next time.